When I walked in, I said, half in jest and half the opposite. We were hoping nobody would come and then maybe we wouldn't have to do this. Um, because almost whatever comes out of your mouth or out of your head seems superfluous <laughs> or trivializes the thing. And, and I have to say, for all the, the exhibitions and design debates in galleries and theses and juries that go on here forever and ever and ever, this one is, is probably the most quizzic, quizzical and in the end the most impenetrable. And we can, we can open it up as, as far as I'm concerned. It's, this is very different. And, you know, it's funny. I was, I was walking upstairs, and some of you remember the discussion we had last week or a couple of weeks ago about Brian's exhibit downstairs with the machine or the mischievous machine, um, and whether the two exhibits are connected in any way. In other words, what the meaning is of the machine as it operates um, without a hand to guide it, or what hand guides it. But maybe there's a connection between the two. Brian probably would prefer not to deal with that. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Connect the dots. If you want to. I hadn't thought about that. Um, it's an interesting speculation to, to consider. Um, I think that as exhibitions, they're probably disconnected. Uh, but there's a kind of meta content that could connect them, which has to do with uh, sort of extreme versions of rationality. Um, and some would argue that uh, the end game of a, an extremely rational world is, in fact, the Holocaust. Um, and that uh, a kind of industrialized murder was perpetrated. And uh, interestingly, what one of the things, there are many, but one of the things setting it apart would be the fact that uh, the Nazis went to great lengths uh, to make it legal uh, to use uh, the force of law and the courts to first uh, to first uh, demonize the Jewish people and then to um, strip them of their citizenship and then to deport them and then deportation led to uh, murder on a mass scale that the world never saw before. So one could implicate machinery and rationality in that as a kind of mechanism of the state. So that's maybe as far as I could go with that at this point, just thinking about it. You know, the machine will do whatever you tell it to do. So anyone who wants to deify it or to, or to make the case that technology ipso facto means progress, no, it, it, it doesn't. There is a connection, I think. You know, I was looking, I have a book here. Maybe some, some of you will be interested in it at some point. And there's a drawing, there's a drawing, okay? An architect made a drawing of the town. Have you seen it, Alexis? Yeah, no, I thought, an, an architect, I, I don't remember his name, but I was looking at this a few minutes ago, made a drawing of a town that was to be integrated as, as an enlargement of, of the Auschwitz project. It's a town, and it has a school, and, and it has all of these pieces, and they fit in, and he drew that. And, <laughs> and when you look at the pieces that, that were made, were designed, were engineered, were discussed, somebody sat there and did this and worked on it. People, just people. 
thousands of people. Okay. Um, I, I, I said I don't have a lot of answers, but there are questions, and, and these might be worth touching on and see what Russell has to say, and then maybe what the audience has to say. My sense is there are really two kinds of discussions possible. One is the specifics of the proposal, which seems to have two pieces. One, the Burkina plan with a, with a shredded paper on it, which, which is an installation in the spirit of the proposal. And then the other piece would be the proposal. And then the second, or maybe the first question is, what is all this sitting on? What is it about? What engenders it? Where does it come from? So let me just, just I have a couple of notes. Let me raise a few questions, and we'll see what we can do to, to try to, to, to answer them. Um, the first question has to do with, is a discussion of the design of, of a memorial for Auschwitz, is that a design discussion which is a unique category in the design discourse? In other words, is it something that relates to other things? So, so should we talk about Peter's piece in Berlin? Should we talk about Maya Lin's piece uh, for the Vietnam War? Or is this a project and a discussion that Russell and Eric took on unique to the discourse of design and architecture? It, that's a good question and one that we pondered a long time. I think when we first started working on this, um, we thought to ourselves, we talked about between ourselves and said, no, this doesn't apply to anything else. This is unique. Uh, this is specific to this place and this event, and it's as specific as this event is. Um, I think, though, when you place this into the context of other ideas about memorialization, about how we have made these kinds of things and how we will make them now and how we speculate about how to make them in the future, then we slowly came to the understanding that, yes, this has a much larger context. Um, on one hand, Auschwitz, Birkenau, the Shoah, is unique in that it defies being memorialized to a certain degree, as certainly Auschwitz does. Um, you can't represent it. Um, on the other hand, the proposal is uh, meant as a physical fact. It fundamentally changes the way you understand the place. Um, I was mentioning to you the other day that um, <clears throat> a curious thing we learned along the way was that in English, we have one word for memorial, and I think we're fairly familiar with types of memorials. They're meant as commemorations of events, uh, to, uh, as mnemonics to remember uh, important people uh, or even catastrophes. Uh, but in German, there are two words for memorial, and one is a uh, uh, denkmal, which means it in the conventional sense, we understand it in English. And the other is a uh, manmal, and uh, a manmal in German, as far as I understand it, means uh, a warning. Uh, it's meant as something that is erected to warn people off to say, never let this happen again. Uh, I think Peter's memorial is certainly in that realm. Uh, ours is certainly meant in that way. Um, but I think one other thing that's curious is they had a competition in 1957 to make a memorial at Auschwitz. And there's a memorial there now when you go there to visit, and it's not very good. Uh, it's, and the reason this is not very good is that the winner of the competition, a, a team led by a man named Oscar Hansen, um, proposed uh, something that was incredibly abstract. Henry Moore was the, on the head of the jury. Um, and it was basically a kind of flat causeway that went through a diagonal through Berkenau. Uh, and 
his proposal was that you would walk on this platform and not be able to walk on the ground, and that you would, uh, the rest of the camp would be left to decay, um, which is doing by itself now. 85% of it is gone already. Um, so it was a way of understanding this very fragile landscape, uh, this tragic figure, in a different way. But it, Hansen's idea was very unique and revolutionary for the time, 1957. Uh, he called it a no-object space. And certainly you can see in Maya Lin's work, for example, that the wall of the memorial in DC is meant to be uh, something that is not necessarily about itself, but to sponsor a contemplation about what it uh, goes on there. So probably I know when you go there, what's more compelling uh, than the wall is what the wall sponsors, people rubbing the names, people leaving flowers and candles. Uh, I don't know what our proposal would engender, but it's certainly in the spirit of those things. Right. It, I mean, it raises, raises another question, which, which I was coming to later. But since you mentioned what exists on the site, so this is a different question. And it has to do with the time that belongs to us, as opposed to, to the time that belonged to others before us or will belong to others after us vis-a-vis -vis an event which is perhaps unique as a historical category on its own that runs forward and backward forever. And so the question is, isn't your critique of the, of the memorial on the site the inevitable critique of someone 40 years later, who will look back at something that had an allegiance or an argument or an ideology or a conception and a constituency, Henry Moore constituency, not to, not to hold him responsible, and that inevitably whatever is done will at some point belong to a category in history that's superseded by something else and will be looked at as a piece of history that belongs to a particular time. And you can't get over that. Can you? No. So, this, it's a good question because it cuts into some things that I think we, th we thought a lot about uh, and continue to think about, which is um, there, are, there are physical facts about this place that um, are difficult. Um, some of them are that, uh, as I mentioned, this Bear Canal, there are two camps. A lot of people don't know that. So if you look at the, simply the, the drawing, the maps, uh, Auschwitz I, which is actually pre-existed as an uh, Austro-Hungarian army barracks and was appropriated by the Nazis, was the initial camp. And that's the one that has the sign, Arbet macht frei. Uh, and it's the one where all the exhibits of the hair and the shoes and the photos and all of the things that a museum has uh, are located there, and those things were appropriated, the, the objects were appropriated from Berkenau. But Berkenau was built uh, a few years later, in uh, 41, I believe, uh, and it is four or five times larger than Auschwitz I, and its sole purpose was to exterminate people, Jewish people primarily, but obviously there were others involved too, um, in prison there. Um, but I guess the point is that it, Berkenau is in a state of disrepair because after the end of the war uh, and the, Poland became uh, part of the Soviet Union, the state uh, sponsored a museum there, but they could only deal with uh, Auschwitz I uh, because it was pretty much intact. And Auschwitz II, Berkenau, was also never made to last. It was made of uh, temporary horse stables were the barracks, and so the 
the Nazis' idea was once the thing was finished that uh, they would close it down and erase it uh, and essentially build the town over it. It's a curious thing when you go to uh, the town, uh, and Roman, you can correct my Polish, but when you go to Osvisim, uh, the you can see some very new buildings that were built there, new as in they're newer than the, the ancient structures. And they were built by the Nazis and they were housing for all of the professionals and uh, people that they were encouraging to immigrate from Germany because they actually wanted to, to take that region back. And so, uh, you know, Himmler's idea, uh, he was very interested in farming. This is what I have been told. And his idea was that people would come from Germany, resettle the land, and that they would lead to a kind of uh, more ethical society. Uh, and, and so uh, the idea of building over the camp and that it was temporary is, is a big part of the way it was conceived. Um, I guess uh, Eric and I were interested in, in really changing your understanding of that place um, by taking it out of, uh, out of the regime, we say, of culture and moving it into a kind of regime of nature. So it would be something that lasted longer. It would, it would in the uh, words of our friend David Myers, it would uh, provide a kind of uh, uh, perpetual indeterminacy it would, unlike a museum, it would not provide you with an answer, but it would continue to kind of provoke a question because it was something that was being, in a sense, withheld or your experience of that place would be fundamentally altered because you could no longer go into it. So I think it is a reaction to maybe the, the path that clearly the, the Auschwitz Museum, it's, it's a UNESCO site now. They're committed to a, a sort of limited restoration. But the irony of the restoration is because Birkenau is, is so, uh, so much of it is gone and that it's literally falling apart, is that they're constantly rebuilding it in order to maintain its sort of status as a ruin. And you know, that, uh, I guess we were thinking restoration, which is the path they're on, or simply letting it go, which was another idea uh, that's, that someone has uh, proposed. We were trying to find a kind of third way to mark this place. I mean, it's the largest Jewish cemetery in the world, and there's no marking really for it as such. So we are interested in all of these things, but to answer your question, I think it's kind of fundamentally different I, I, in reality. I think, I think the point is just, now it's uh, trying to come up with something that, that had this sort of durability as art and as meaning that jumps over huge pieces of, of time because our presumption is that what happened there is in a certain sense timeless at least, at least from the perspective that we want to be careful that it's not forgotten. Therefore, we're talking about how should it be remembered but I think my point would be that however we try to remember it, that that act of remembrance is itself limited to a perspective in a particular point in time and will find itself, I think, dated. I mean, there may be some, I was thinking of, of, of what they call the wounded slave that you can see those pieces in the church in Firenze, the Michelangelo pieces, and nobody really, you know, the, you know the image, and nobody really knows whether he quit in the middle of the job uh, um, and went on to other things, or whether the expression of the figure trying to bust out of the marble was, was what he wanted to leave, because it's often cited as a sensibility that would belong to a contemporary perspective on art, notwithstanding it's 500 years old. But it's very difficult to do that, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, and maybe this is, this is because, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in history, and some of you have heard me try to talk about it. I don't think I know what it is, or who says so, or what it means. And, and the, question, the question with respect to, to Auschwitz, which I, I think Auschwitz is the epiphany of the attempt by, by the Nazis to destroy the Jews. 
So there's Mauthausen and there's and so on and so on and so on. But this is, this is, the, this is the focus or this is the essence or this is the capital of destruction. And, and the question is for students of history who can explain this to us, is this a chapter in a chronology of historic events that we recognize? You know, people talk about history and they say, well, you have to understand the past in order all of that stuff and not to repeat it or you do repeat it anyway or whatever, whatever they say. And the question is, if that's so, then, then what, in what context should we understand the development of Auschwitz? In other words, it's one of two possibilities. Either it's, it's an anomaly, it's an anomaly, it couldn't happen again, maybe we'll get to that. It's an anomaly in human behavior, in scale, in, in hate, in evil, or whatever it is, or it belongs to a story it has antecedents, it has precedents, it has a kind of chronology, actually, that you can trace over a long period of time, meaning it didn't just happen all of a sudden. Everybody who loved Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn and, and, and so on and so on, all of a sudden ran out and started killing the Jews. So, I mean, this is, as I said in the beginning, I don't know that anyone can answer that, but in terms of trying to take a crack at understanding what we're dealing with here, whether you think there's a chronology for this story, or whether you think this is an anomaly in a long historic story, probably says something about how you try to represent it or explain it or understand it. So, I'm gonna take a crack at that. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to maybe speak a little bit uh, from my own firsthand experience. I, I went there, uh, Eric and I did the exact opposite things. He went there first and then we, he, uh, he came back and then we weren't dealing with this at all, although we talked about it a bit here and there. And then we started working on this um, and it originally actually just anecdotally came from uh, when we were students and we were living in, um, in Florence, we were working there, we went up to Munich to visit some family of Eric's and, uh, and then they said, what are you else are you gonna do in Munich? And we said, we're, we were thinking to go out to Dachau, which is a, uh, another Nazi camp that was in Germany, but it wasn't a extermination camp. Um, and they thought we were crazy, but we went, and that was probably our uh, first experience, both of us, to, to go to a place like that. And we walked away from it with a, a dissatisfaction with the way it was presented, the, the kind of, the way the grounds had been neatly restored, manicured, uh, it was bucolic, it was, it was pleasant. Uh, and of course, you would see all of the kind of displays of the, the ovens and things and set up uh, to make you understand, oh, this is what it must have been like to be here. Uh, and, we, and then you go into the sort of existing barracks buildings and there are all the photos of the horrific photographs of what went on there. And uh, we were talking to Kipnis about this and, and he, he made a comment that I thought was interesting is he said that um, it was pornographic the way the material was presented. And because it was so taken out of the kind of context and put into this sort of curated uh, way of understanding it. And I, it's a long story to say that I think a lot of these memorials, exhibits, museums try to explain it. And when you try to explain it, for some people they accept the explanation and then uh, they say, okay, now I know the facts and now I can have some kind of understanding of what occurred. And for us, understanding it or pretending to understand it is the first step towards forgetting it. And uh, I think it's an impenetrable question that place is. And when I went there, I think like many, many people, you desperately want to connect to something there. 
And I think if you're a survivor, you have one kind of connection to that place that, you know, um, uh, Elie Vessel said that uh, if you weren't there, you can't speak of it, and if you were there, you won't speak of it. Um, but, you know, my, my other good friend, Michael Berenbaum, said to me that his response to Elie Wiesel was, well, we can speak of it. If we weren't there, we can speak of it. We can use different words. Um, but when I went there, you know, you walk the grounds, you, you, you touch the wood, and you want desperately to feel that something, some kind of understanding of that. And it really is impenetrable. It's just opaque. And I, it, I was just reading an interview with Martin Amos, who has written a couple of novels, the English uh, novelist writer. And he's written a, a, a book now about Auschwitz. Uh, it's just come out. And um, his comment was, he said, when I first came on to the subject of the Shoah, that uh, you know, I read these books, and then for the next 15 years, I just immersed myself in the material. And he said, when I was done doing that, I had a kind of anti-epiphany. He said, I came away from it realizing it was just as opaque as when I started to look into it. And I, I don't have that kind of breadth of scholarship, but I came away from that place the same way, that it was opaque, it resists a kind of explanation. I, I wouldn't purport to try to provide one. The proposal is not about providing an explanation. It's simply about perpetuating a question. And we were thinking about this idea that far off into the future, because I think the idea of restoring this place now is about the kind of near time, but far off into the future when it can no longer be restored without really just uh, trying to recreate it, um, that the question would be asked again when the, when the proposal breaks apart, when by entropy it falls apart, it would force the question again to be asked, what is this place, what do we do with this place? And the next generation has to ask that question. I, I have a, a thought. Uh, some of you know my, my father wrote a poem. It's really a prose poem. We published it after he died, Janus Press. I think you can still get it on Amazon. It's called Holy Holocaust. Um, and it's 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 an odd mix of of linguistics and history and street talk and and uh, serious historicism, but what it what its effort is is of great interest. And at the time we had we had a hell of a time when he was still alive. We had a hell of a time trying to publish it. Because the, the premise is, is controversial, although less so now. And the premise was, and this is why I asked the question a few minutes ago, the premise was something very different. That the history, uh, some of you won't care for this, but the history of institutional Christianity holds in it from the earliest times not Jesus per se, but the people who made a church in the name of Jesus and have, and have systematically with programs, with texts, everyone, if you look at, and, and you can do this, if you, look in a, if you look in a thesaurus from 1930, Jew, cheap, so on, Shylock, Shakespeare, Canterbury Tales, I remember years ago at Harvard, and I can't remember, I, I think the guy's name was, you know, you guys know the, the, the campus at Harvard and Memorial Hall, and up on Memorial Hall are all the famous characters who did whatever they did, Galileo, and did all this great stuff. And up there is an 8th century guy, his name is St. John Chrysostom. Any Catholics in the audience? He's a saint. You know the guy? So this is the most vitriolic anti-Semite. I didn't know the name. I remember looking up the name and trying to find out who was this guy because he's up on the wall at Harvard. He must matter for something or other, and he does. Uh, and, and this is only to say, this is not to go after Christianity per se, but there is, is a long and documented, well-documented history. And the point of this discussion is to say that there, that there are very clear antecedents, both in the Catholic Church, Martin Luther. Take a look at, I mean, if, if you know the history of Martin Luther, you take a look at, at, at the popes 
in the years preceding, uh, uh, there's an interesting book called Hitler's Pope, some of you may know. So this isn't to take what is the essence away from the German nation at the time, but there is, I think, to be fair, an interesting argument for a very long and detailed history of institutional Christianity and the culture that surrounds it as it relates to what, what many people felt in Germany and Austria and Poland and the Ukraine and the Balkans and France and ever heard of the Dreyfus Affair? You know, a few problems in Spain in the 10th century and started kicking people out and says it's a long, long history and you can look at it, you can debate it, you can, you can wonder who's complicit, who did what, who did, and there's certainly people who did the opposite and so on and so on. But it seems to me it's a point, I mean, I mean, I recommend the book to you, and, and uh, it's not done in a scholarly way, which would be typical of him, but it is scholarly in, in, in its essence. Uh, another thing that, that, that I, I, I throw out, how many of you have got, been in a concentration camp? Just... Uh, not so many. Are you angry? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you, when you think, so we're, we're sitting here and we're la relaxed and have some water and sit around and speculate <laughs> and all of this. I, I went into, I went down the stairs, uh, Hernan knows these guys, with, with, with some friends in Mauthausen when I was, was spending time in Vienna. It was in the middle of the winter and you go down the stairs, this is on the cover of, and you go down the stairs which are cut into the stone. So didn't didn't have any masons out there. They were cut by hand by the prisoners. It's a quarry, Mauthausen. It's a stone quarry, and you go then and you see this. But <laughs> if you take a picture of Mauthausen in the snow, so it looks like a resort or something. This is so odd. And I remember going into the walking down the thing and just took off running. So the question is. At what emotional level do we deal with this? Is it an intellectual problem, an art artistic problem, or are you just beyond words angry? <laughs> just angry. Angry. Are you angry? It's, I can't reduce it to a single emotion, but I, it, it's an incredibly emotional subject, obviously. Uh, I think it's... Um, I mentioned my going there in reverse of Eric because it turned out then that I studied this with him for four or five years before I finally went, which a couple of years ago. And um, so I went there with, armed kind of with the facts and the understandings and the conversations, the endless conversations we had with between uh, Eric and I and me and with uh, other friends and colleagues. and very kind of patient and long. And then when I went there, it's it's pure emotion. Uh, all of the facts leave you, obviously. Uh, I say obviously because everyone would say, yes, of course, you go there. That's the only way you can sort of understand it. Um, anger is just one of the many things that are kind of wrapped together uh, about how I feel about it. Um, it's anger like you want to, you know, Put your fist through the wall or somebody's head or something yeah, like that. I you don't know. I, I, yeah, not for me, but uh, I mean, I just, but I, the other kinds of anger, meaning that, you know, I don't, to, to go back to your other question. I'm not saying that's particularly constructive no, or intelligent no. or anything, I mean, I but it's, it's a, it's a kind sign of if you don't know how else to react. But um, maybe it's as appropriate as anything else. Yeah, perhaps. But, uh, but no, I, I was going to say your earlier question. I think this has a long lineage, and it's not finished. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to know there is a history. There is a history in the culture of that, 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 that one who wanted to move in the direction that the Nazis moved in could be sustained at least at some level because the Jews killed Jesus you know, so we, I, I didn't say that 
as an established fact. Is it, don't, is this delicate enough? But this is the story that was told and told and retold. You know, that Jewish uh, people took Christian uh, children and drank their blood and all of this. And it's these stories, are horrible stories, which are passed along for, for, for centuries. Interesting guy, we, we talk about Peter, maybe we'll get to that, what he did in Berlin. He has a brother named Robert Eisenman, who wrote a very, inter one of the guys who released the Dead Sea Scrolls, a very unusual uh, character, who wrote a book called James the Just in Jerusalem in dealing with a period, very early period, in the development of Christianity after Jesus was killed, and trying to sort out the story, not in terms of the authors of the Gospels, or even the Gnostic Gospels, but in terms of what really is a political analysis of who did what to whom and why. The, the Jewish Jews, the Gentile Jews, the Romans, and so on. It's a fascinating, it's a very well-known book. And James, who is the brother of Jesus, if you're interested in that, it's, 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 it's part of the story because it's where this story starts, in a way. Um, what else should we talk about? I don't know, I, 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 made a, I made a note about this, I think you mentioned this, the SS, when the Russians were coming in, the, Rus the SS tried to destroy Auschwitz, they obviously uh, didn't succeed. But there's, but there's another, I mean, there are a couple other stories in this in terms of, of complicity, that the British in London, the Americans in New York and Washington knew a hell of a lot about this. The story is always obviated, ambiguous, nobody knew, nobody knew. There's a lot of evidence that, that, that there were other people in other places with other obligations, other responsibilities in the world during that war who knew a hell of a lot about this. I mean, you could ask, why didn't they bomb it? Or why didn't they attack it in some way? Why did they let it go? So this is an open question, but it, I, I think it's pretty clear with the documentation we have that this was something that was going on and people knew it was going on. This wasn't a secret, not a secret. It's often, oh my God, Eisenhower showed up and what do you know? So this is not the, this is not the accurate story. So there are all kinds of people who are ducking and bobbing and weaving and hiding the story, always trying to show, you know, they did it, you know. Uh, the Austrians are still like that. You know, the Germans did it, not the Austrians. Um, anyway, I, I, I think the only point was as a part of the story that the world knew, that the world let it go, that, that German capital, and I mean, a part of it, you're not talking about this so far, but this was also a labor camp. So they killed people, but well, I mean, and there was a theory of sticking people in, in, in ovens, but it was also a slave labor camp, many slave labor agriculture and industry and manufacturing and construction and all kinds of things, and medical people involved in this, all of that. Uh, so that, so that it, it should be clear that, that Germany as a nation and as a group, not a few guys, and we never heard about this, but, but German industry was heavily invested in this process and in the labor that was involved. Is it worth Yeah, when you drive around uh, the town, I mean, there are these two main camps, but it's true what you're saying. I mean, they're, they're the relics of all these very large factory buildings. Some of them are falling apart. Some of them are still being used. But the, there were over sort of 40 sub-camps around there. And Buna, Monowitz, which was the name of the work factory camps, was extensively all through the town. Uh, and that's where all the labor came from. I mean, originally the idea of how to exterminate people would be to work them to death. So but what I'm saying is, and, and that's, that's true, but just so, so, so people, apparatus. right, so yeah. that people understand that, that it was labor to do what? 
and particularly when the Russians started pushing back in the other direction and the, the needed labor and industry and all of that, that there was a pretty clear investment and commitment in the capacity of these camps to produce labor that was necessary to keep the German nation going. And that's a, this is, this is, this is uh, part of a, uh, a very tough story also. Um, I know we want to, we, we get to the exhibit in one second. I just, I just had a couple of things I, I wanted to talk about. Um, one is, who thinks about this? Um, who cares about this? And, and I, one of, one of the, the, the issues for us in our culture with, I mean, it's not just iPhones, but it's every app and voodoo and film and game and celebrity and politician and so on and so on. Where is there in that context room for us to think about this? Doesn't, doesn't the current culture put your mind everywhere and there's no place you can go where it's just you and yourself. And if that's true, isn't the world that we live in less and less conducive to, to, to contemplating this and what Eric and Russell are trying to do? We're going the other direction, I think, maybe. Huh? Maybe we always have. Yeah, OK. Um, Do you know the story of Pandora's box? Yes. Huh? <laughs> Would you like to tell it? <laughs> I was thinking my son could tell it better. <laughs> yeah, let him, <laughs> if he's here. No, no, I Where is he? I won't put him up to that, but. Just well, a little stuff. I mean, to paraphrase it, uh, yeah. it, probably that the unopened box produces a sort of increasing uh, desire to know what's in it. And then ultimately when you open it, it's catastrophic. Well, this, was, this, was, this is a too sophisticated interpretation. Okay. But, the, but the, the story in it, in what, the, what your son would tell, I think, is that Pandora was the first woman on Earth that the gods made. Yeah, did you know that? Um, and had a number of assets and a couple of liabilities, and the liability was, was insatiable curiosity. <laughs> so the gods, of course, gave her a box with all kinds of stuff in it, you know, evil and disease and whatever else it was, and said, don't open it, and of course she opened it, and and evil and disease and so on went into the world. But before everything got out, she closed the box and left hope, hope in the box. That's the story of Pandora. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about the, the specific Proposal. So maybe you want to explain what what the installation and what it is, and 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 yeah, can we do that? Yeah, I mean, um, two things I want to say. One is I'll talk about that in one second. But you know, when we first moved from simply thinking about this place and uh, all of the issues surrounding it, seeing it in the news, understanding the fragility, understanding the. Uh, the his short history of, of trying to make a museum there and to preserve what's there and why and uh, the need for doing that. Um, when we moved to actually making a proposal that tried to capture something about the way we were thinking about it, um, I remember the first time we showed it to David, uh, he asked us, are you serious about this? Are you gonna build, do you wanna build this? And we looked at each other and said, not sure if that's really what we're thinking. Um, because uh, there was a kind of audacity to even think about that. And we weren't think of it, thinking of it as if it were a, a project that we were seeking to realize, and that would be its sort of most potent form. 
And then later, I think we started thinking, or I think David said to us, you need to be serious about it. He said, if you want to do this, you have to stand behind it. You have to say, yes, we're, you know, that was his advice. And I think it was really good advice to kind of push the thing forward and for us to stop maybe being so uh, academic about it. I think uh, just, you know, a few months before Eric passed away, we were having lunch and having a conversation about it. And uh, he said to me, um, I kept, I think I said to him something uh, along the lines of, you know, this is a very difficult thing to propose as a realistic, you know, a, that we would like to build this. I said, every time I mention that to someone, their reaction is everything from anger uh, to uh, disbelief, uh, you know, incredulity that you, you, you need to walk in there. I mean, I've had colleagues say, you, you can't take that away from people. And our response was always to try to explain and say, we're not taking it away from you, we're changing how you understand this place. Uh, and there's a difference. But I think what, what Eric said to me that when we were having that, that last lunch was he said, uh, perhaps this project, is its value is not in realizing it, but its value, like a lot of architectural discussion and, and discourse, is that it's another way of keeping this question alive and that we're discussing it in a much broader context about what these things mean. And that at that moment, it was as if we could say, we will take this proposal, uh, an, uh, you know, thinking about this place, and we could show this at the museum at Auschwitz because it's not saying we don't want to restore, or we, we have a, an idea that's contrary to you. It's simply about perpetuating this question well, can about you, what can this Can you just is. give us a specifics of the proposal? Yeah. So the proposal, I'll talk about that first. The proposal, um, which you can see in the small gallery there, was that in 2045, uh, which would be 100 years after the liberation of the camp, that uh, after the last survivor has passed out of this world, that we, uh, trees would be cut from the countries in Europe where Jews were deported proportionally, and they'd be brought to the camp, and that we would erect this large barrier uh, by stacking the logs um, around the perimeter of Birkenau. Auschwitz I, the museum, would remain intact, and it would be the place that would record all the facts, and it would explain in a kind of curatorial manner. But two... How, how do you do that? I mean, you dig a hole and throw this the logs in a hole, or no, you they would build be, a perimeter? You How do you build do a it? perimeter, yeah. So they would be stacked around the perimeter. Um, so from they build up from the grade, not down into the ground? No, they build up from grade, yeah. And essentially... Um, How high are they? Uh, I think we were proposing it to be... They, they would be high enough that you can no longer see into you the camp. You can't see in. Yeah. So, you know, the, I think the tallest piece in, the, in Birkenau is the, the tower, the infamous kind of tower where the trains drove drove through to the selection ramp. But once that perimeter was complete, uh, the idea then was that it would be, we called it blanking the site because we didn't like the idea of saying we were withholding it or that we were erasing it. We weren't doing any of those things. We were simply altering the way you understand it. So at that point, after you would see the museum at one and understand everything, that you would move around the perimeter of this and a big part of that was, uh, I think, uh, and I can't tell you if this would be effective or not, but this was the desire, <clears throat> was that you would no longer be going to Berkenau to seek more facts, to seek more understanding, to seek more uh, connection, because you can't find it anyway. Uh, but rather, you would be walking around the perimeter of this thing, and like the box, it would be withheld. Uh, in some way, so you'd be fundamentally altering the way you would understand it, and the hope was that it would be a kind of provocation in the spirit of the idea of the manma, uh, the warning, that you would contemplate not what is it, but why is it? And you can't answer that question. Why, why logs? Well, be, because we were interested in something that was on one hand uh, had longevity, but on the other hand would eventually decay. Can you climb on the logs or run around the logs? The well, kids, kids live in the neighborhood and they say, hey, there's a pile of logs. Let's yeah, go jump on that. Yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, people do that at Peter's thing in Berlin, you were telling me in the film. But, but is uh, that I mean, I, prohibited I think, or you do whatever you want? Once the thing's there, you do whatever you want. I don't know. I mean, at some point you release that into the world. Uh, I, I don't know what the kind of acceptable behavior would be at that place, but I would imagine that you wouldn't want to do that, but I couldn't say that it wouldn't happen. So. No, but I mean, you could set it up in a way that yeah. sequesters it and you yeah. can't get on it. That's the desire. Because the desire is to, to take it out of the world of understanding as we know it. And eventually when this place would decay, and it would eventually breach, uh, is that the, at that moment, of course, the camp would be overgrown. And then uh, we, our, our idea was that at that moment it would have to be reconsidered. So, and that would be What's, something can, that we would Can you give us, uh, give the uh, local constituency here an idea of the dimension that you're talking about? Yeah, From one I, end to the other of Birkenau, in other words, what are we talking about for logs? How, what's the distance? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a planned dimension. Yeah, I, I don't know the planned dimensions. I believe it's about 40 acres, if you give you an idea of that. So um, uh, it's immensely vast, so. I mean, yeah. the, the question really has to do whether it's visually measurable or accessible in the sense that a town is, has a kind of legibility, whereas depending on where you are and what the weather is, you can sit and look at the ocean and you don't know whether you're looking at 50 miles or 50 feet, yeah. are you, getting, you know what I mean? And, and the sense of distance and time and the legibility of the site as buildings would be very different as, as a piece of a yeah. disemboweled forest or something. Yeah. It reminded me, some of you may have seen it, but if you go to Angkor Wat, there are trees, the, the old buildings, which are uh, not quite ancient, but, but hundreds and hundreds of years old, and there are trees growing out of the roofs of, of the buildings. So. In, in, Eisenman's, in Eisenman's project in Berlin, I mentioned this to Russell the other day. I, I, was, I was in a hotel in Vienna and I was supposed to do something and it started to rain, so I couldn't go, so I turned on the TV. And there's a program, an hour program, you probably wouldn't find so much in America. So somebody had gone to the, to the uh, uh, memorial in, in Berlin and set a camera up to shoot down the aisle between the, between the, the, the stones. So they showed, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, and go behind the stone, little kids jumping skateboards from, from stone to stone, all of this. And then some elderly people bitching like hell. Nobody remembers why this is here. That the, that the purpose or the message had been lost. And while they're talking, come a couple adults eating yogurt, you know, walking through. I mean, on one hand, it was, it was illuminating, and it has to do with just the process of time. And I remember saying to Peter, I think when he came to do, to do a, a graduation talk, that inadvertently produced a, a unique kind of urbanism with no Barneys, no Prada, uh, no commerce, no per se in French laundry, no fancy restaurants and clothes and all of that. And it was one of the most vital pieces of urbanism in Berlin, having relatively little to do with the original purpose of the project. So, I mean, th this is not quite the analogy, but the question is, do you make something like this and put the logs up like this and presume that they'll deteriorate, which they probably will over some period of time, and then just let people do what they want. So the kids from the neighborhood are 11 years old and have no idea what the hell is going on, or maybe they do. I think the Germans are they're reasonably decent at telling their own story, unlike the Japanese and the Austrians. And, and so do you allow that? In, a, in other words, do you allow it to take on its own life as a function 
of the people who inhabit the world today? Or do you obligate the project in a particular way that insists that they understand, guess what we did? We made a perimeter and we put in the sticks and we raised them to a certain height and now you can't see what happened. So pay attention and find out what happened. So the, the question is how the art delivers the message or precludes the message or whether it turns into, in the end, a kind of environmental project and whether, it, whether in the end it makes the point emphatically enough. And this is, of course, easy to say, but or or to question. Nevertheless, it, it's probably a fair question. Yeah, no, I think it is. But I think maybe the difference is that when you go here, you go here purposefully. I think people who go there know what it is that's there. The only curious thing that happen, happens there that I found is that a lot of the parts of the camp that were never developed but were part of Birkenau have been sold off to the people in the town. And you, you'll walk around the perimeter of the camp and you'll come and you'll see people's houses like almost right up to the fence. And, uh, and they're on the ground that was originally the camp. And it's a curious kind of way of erasing that, uh, that it's, it's being encroached upon. I think this kind of happens with Civil War sites <laughs> and things like that. But, but C I, by, again, CBRE is over there. Yeah, but I yeah. think that the, the difference is then maybe just trying to understand a town is when you go here, I think you know why you're going. I think you know what it is. And I think there's enough information about it. That but if you're you a younger person, if you're a younger person, I mean, this is what was happening in Berlin, you know, yogurt eaters and skateboard jumpers and, and all of that. And it turned it into a kind of very animated, Connecticut, happy experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, well, the question is whether that's a danger or whether that's inevitable. And this goes back to the question of whether, whether a certain kind of art has the right durability, or whether it just, uh, I mean, when you think about destroying the sense of the camp, and you think that that's what the SS tried to do, you know, so, so is there an argument for reconstituting it in some way, or is it better to have a constructed mechanism to allow it to disappear? So is it, it, at least, so can you tell us about the- Yeah, the, life uh, rules. Yeah. Right. Can you tell us about the, the yeah, paper one? Yeah, the installation. I mean, you know, I think when we were thinking this summer uh, about how to show the work, uh, clearly we could show the work that uh, can be on the wall or in a book effectively in both, both ways to sort of explain the proposal. But, you know, like, I, I guess this cuts to also one of the reasons that it's interesting is because we were asking what can what role can architecture play in this situation? And there, I think there are not many times when architecture can be filled with this much content. Um, and so we were asking ourselves, how as architects can we make something in this space that isn't a model of the proposal, it doesn't try to be that, but in a way has a kind of illusion to some of the qualities of the proposal. Now, obviously, the scale, you know, um, quantity has a quality all its own. So it's not necessarily about that. But I think what the installation tries to do is it's the figure of Berkenau. And the figure uh, with the proposal, and even when you go there, the kind of vastness of that place, the figure of that is the one thing that you can't kind of shake. So the, the, the installation is the figure of Berkenau. It's enlarged, as large as we can make it in that space. You can't go inside of it. You can only walk around it. It never shows itself completely uh, when you walk around it. The shredded paper is, uh, has allusions to um, you know, the, the kind of endless rational bureaucracy of the Nazis to keep paper on every single thing, which ultimately implicated them in all these I things. I think Or Orson Welles made a film you can still get of the trial and he turned it into a bureaucracy with endless desks and oh, files right. and, and all of that. 
this is a very old film, black and white film, but it's pretty good. But when you, when you see the shredded, you know, and at first when I looked at it, I thought, so maybe this is the names again, or what was left of the names. But it's, it, it, I mean, it has a different quality if you turn this into something which was just a bureaucratic process, yeah. like trying to get a building permit, talk to the plumbing guys yeah. and the fire department, yeah, and, and by the way, let's kill a few people. And, 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 but there is something about that kind of engine of bureaucracy that once it starts to run, in its sort of mindless way, back to the original question of the machine. But I have to say, the, the, the installation, I think, has a lot of potency, really. It has a lot of power. And I think because it's somewhere between some form and no form, but it's not, it's not an environmental piece, so it's built and it's clear enough but it's also deteriorating and is starting to disintegrate, but not so you couldn't understand what it is. And oddly enough, you got all these wires, which I think is an accident. But <laughs> so you got the wires coming into the top, which looks like somewhere in this thing, whatever the hell is going on, it's been mechanized, which also has something to do. I don't know whether it is, but when I saw it, I thought, so this is, this is either inadvertent, but it adds something that the that the wires are coming or the electricity is coming or the machines are coming. So this is different than putting it out in the desert. I think it, it, it has a lot of power. So what else should we talk about? Maybe that's enough. Huh? Could it happen again? Maybe we just leave that an open question. Huh? Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Bye.